Welcome to First Baptist Conroe and thanks for joining us at FC. Here are a few announcements to get you connected this week. Wherever you are in your walk with Jesus, we want to help you take your next step. If you love FC on Wednesdays, you'll love joining us for life groups and church on Sundays. Life groups start at 945 and we have groups for everyone. Are you wanting to dig even deeper into God's Word? Then we hope you'll stick around for FC Equip immediately following FC. FC Equip will better equip you with the knowledge that it takes to make disciples. Hey Pilgrim, are you excited to celebrate Thanksgiving? We hope you will join us for an extra special Wednesday night, November 16th, for FC Friendsgiving. Don't be a turkey. Invite some friends and come hang out. That night we will gobble up a feast and have some fun. More rolls? You better believe it. Let's give them pumpkin to talk about. Your friendships may flower. You may see your friends. Lastly, we want to encourage you to connect with us on social media. Make sure you follow FC on Instagram and like us on Facebook.
Hey guys, are y'all doing all right? Awesome. Hey guys, well, I'm so glad that you guys are here tonight. I'm excited. We're, we're continuing our series on the, the hot topics. It's an inside joke. Uh, hot topics. And uh, tonight we're going to be talking about Colts. And I'm not talking about the Indianapolis Colts. Sorry guys. Uh, Matt Ryan's been doing pretty good for being 117 years old, I guess. Uh, but... Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about cults with a U, and uh, we're going to get into that, but it's a really interesting topic and really weird, and I'm sure that you've probably all heard that word before. Uh, maybe as a Christian, you've been, you've been told that you're a part of a cult because you are a Christian. Uh, so what I want to do right now is just turn to your neighbor slash neighbors, and I want you just kind of to think about for like 30 seconds, give everybody a chance to say something. When you hear the word cult, what do you think about? Okay, back up here. So, who would like to share something about cult, something that they think about when they hear that term? Yes, Tito. I think about Catholics. Catholics, okay. Potentially, we might go there. Cult, so it's they. Mormons, okay. The KKK, fans of group. Josh? Hey guys, hey, if, if you're if you're not talking, if you can be quiet, so that way we can hear everybody, respect everybody. Josh, can you say yours again? That was a good one. People that take other people or their project. Okay. Tara, what's that? And uniforms. Okay. Yeah. What? Charles Manson. Okay. Yeah. The host witnesses, their most guy. People that what? A group of people that follow someone. A group of people that follow someone. That's a good one. I was going to say any group of people that gathers together, together, celebrate like an organized religion. Okay, yeah. Got more of that definition based there. Okay, yeah, one more here. All of my crazy friends get together to make some bribery. Okay, that sounds dangerous. Uh, all right. 
So, as you can see, hey guys, this is gonna be, this, I'm gonna move super fast tonight because I've got a lot of information to talk about. So, uh, hope like stay in because if you if you don't, then you're gonna miss something, right? So, as you can tell already, there's a lot of different opinions when it comes to cults. Some of you guys mentioned different groups of people that you might consider a cult. Some of you just gave definitions. Uh, some of you gave pictures in your mind, things like band uniform, you know, things that you think about that kind of connect to a group of people. Uh, so there's, there's kind of things all over the place, and we're going to get to that. So here's what I want to do tonight, just so you kind of understand where we are going. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what a cult is. I'm going to give you a, a definition because I feel like that's important. Uh, some people might have a different definition of a cult, but I'm going to try to explain why I, I'm taking this definition that I have from both the dictionary and then also what scripture has to say. I'm not there yet. And then uh, we're going to get into uh, what does the Bible have to say about cults, and we're going we're gonna to head into some scripture and kind of talk about what Jesus and the apostles had to say about false teachers. And then we're going to get into indicators of cults, so things that we can look for, different signs that maybe show that we have a cult in our, on hand. And then we're going to take a look at a couple of cults specifically and kind of walk through that list of indicators so that you can kind of see uh, where we're headed with that. And then la the last thing, I'm going to just try to help you understand how you can help protect yourself from falling into one of these traps, but also how you can help your friends as well. That's that's kind of where I want to go. Because if I just give you information without help, without a way to apply it, then basically all I'm doing is just giving you information, and that's no fun. So, here we go. Y'all ready? Are you ready? All right, so, so here, like I said, we're going to go for the definition first. So, first we need to know Webster's Dictionary. If you look it up online, this is the definition that they give for... A cult. And it just simply says, a religion regarded as unorthodox. Well, that's really specific, isn't it? So, basically, there's two elements there the religion aspect and the unorthodox aspect. So, when we hear the word religion, we're talking about a group of people that are gathering to worship for some reason, for to worship something. Uh, and then unorthodox means that it's not normal. So, to be orthodox would mean that it fits into the box of what most people consider normal. Unorthodox means that it doesn't fit into that box. Fair enough? Okay, so let's, let's add to this a familiar verse, John 14, 6. John 14, 6. Uh, and what Jesus describes as orthodox faith and, and who he is, because he's defining who he is, which is then how we respond to him. Uh, this is probably a familiar verse. You've probably heard it before. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in that simple verse, Jesus declares who he is and therefore gives us a reason to respond to who he is because he is the way, the truth, the life. He's not one of the ways. He's not a better way. He's not a just an aspect of truth. And he's not just a fragment or a part of life. He is completely the way, the truth, the life. Okay? So taking the dictionary definition and also what Jesus has to say, here's the, here's the definition that we get. Okay? So putting this all together from a Christian perspective, a cult is any religious group religion, that claims to be Christian yet strays away from or denies the fundamentals of biblical living, the way, Biblical truth, truth, or biblical eternity, the life. So when it strays away from that, it becomes unorthodox. Does that make sense? Okay, so are we clear on that definition? Because it's going to be important to understand that when we kind of dig into some of these, why I include some as a cult and some 
as not a cult. All right, so, and then going from there, so this definition is not going to include any completely false religions. So, tonight, I'm not going to talk about Islam. Because Islam does not make a claim that, that Jesus is God. They never claim that. That's not what they, they think there's another way. Completely. So that's not a cult, it's just a false religion. Completely, altogether. Uh, Buddhism, same thing. <laughs> Or just like, find it inside yourself. All right, good luck with that, right? Doesn't, doesn't count. Hinduism. We don't know what's out there, but here's the thing with 17 arms. Okay, that's, we, uh, that's just a false religion. And Judaism, because it rejects Christ. Altogether. So those are just false religions. They're not necessarily a cult. Everybody good with that? Boom. All right, so what does the Bible have to say about this? Because you would think if this was a big deal, something to think about, that the Bible would have something to say about. So let's, let's start with this. Uh, that this should, cult should be a surprise to us because Jesus talked about them and warned us of false teachers. Uh, look at Matthew uh, chapter 24, verses 23 to 26. There it is. Boom. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, for there he is, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, so if they say to you, Look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Jesus is trying to tell us and warn us ahead of time that there's going to be some pretty impressive people and they're going to come around and they're going to have really fancy words. They're going to be able to command an audience. Maybe they can perform some cool tricks like Jezebel. I don't know. But they're going to try to persuade you and sway you to believe something that is not orthodox faith in Christ. And he's saying if they, if they come to you and go, hey, there's this other truth out there, don't. Just don't. Right? It's like the whole, like, is the stove on? Well, let me touch it. No, don't. Just don't touch it. Don't even go for it. But Jesus isn't the only one that warns us. Uh, we get a couple examples from the apostles as well. As well. Uh, Paul warned the church at Ephesus in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verses 29 to 30. So this is, in, uh, this is when Paul is doing his missionary journeys. He begins the church at Ephesus. There's these new believers. Uh, he's trying to disciple them. And he's about to leave them so that they can begin living life as a church. And here's his warning before he leaves. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you. He's not talking about actual wolves. Acts 20, verse 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. There's going to be people that come in that teach you things that are wrong. They're going to twist things up. They're going to mess with Scripture. They're going to try to get you off your game so that you will be led astray. You have to be careful of that. What's cool is that in the book of Revelation... Uh, whenever Jesus is writing the letters to the Ephesians, one of the things, uh, one of the things that Jesus commends the church of Ephesus for is for pushing away false doctrine. So it's kind of a cool picture of how Paul warns them and then they do it. Okay, but he's not the only one. John also tries to help us with false teaching in First John, John's first letter, chapter four, verses one to three. He says, Beloved, it's on the screen, should be, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now he's in the world already. So basically John's going... People that come to you and proclaim the gospel message of Jesus 
meaning teaching who Jesus was and what he did on the cross for you. If they come to you and they're teaching the gospel, yay, hooray, we're good. If they come to you and they try to twist up who Jesus is, if they try to say that there's another way, if they try to say that there's something different, or if you have to add something to Jesus, that's not the message. That's not from God. It's pretty simple. You see that there, right, with John? It either is Jesus, it either is the gospel, and it's from God, or it's not Jesus, and it's not from God. There's no in-between. Cool. So Scripture's pretty clear, right? Scripture warns us. Scripture tries to inform us on how to discern what is right and what is wrong. Gives us some hints on those things. But what are some indicators when we start looking at cults? What are some things that we can see in every single cult that's going to be the same no matter what cult we look at? So here's a list. I came up with six things that will help you kind of process and ask, kind of give you some questions to ask to see whether this is a cult or not. Uh, number one, kind of working off what John said, a cult will ignore or distort the gospel. A cult will ignore or distort the gospel. So one of the ways that they do this is by denying the deity of Jesus. So basically saying, well, Jesus, I mean, he, he kind of was God, but he wasn't really God. Or maybe they add something to the character of Jesus. We'll get into this a little bit later, but maybe it's like, oh, yeah, Jesus, he's, he's Satan's brother. No, that's nowhere in Scripture. So it's, it's either it's changing things or adjusting things to who Jesus was. With, with, with distorting the gospel, they'll do things where faith alone isn't enough. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 tells us that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. That is it. It's not of your works. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Well, a cult will say... Yeah, believe in Jesus, that's great. But also you've got to do X, Y, and Z or else you're not saved. They're distorting the gospel, which means that it becomes false. And here's the, here's the dangerous thing. When you distort the gospel, when you distort the gospel, it leads to the followers of that distorted gospel not experiencing salvation. Mm -hmm. You cannot be justified by a false gospel. Many of you have probably heard this verse before, but Jesus warns about people who will say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. There will be people who know the name of Jesus, but they do not know Jesus. Because the Jesus that they were taught not was a false Jesus. And they were taught a false gospel that is nowhere in the Bible. So that's number one. They'll ignore the sort of gospel. Number two. Usually, a cult will have a charismatic leader who controls and manipulates followers. They'll typically have a charismatic leader who controls and manipulates followers. So most cults are usually started by one person. Now, this, eventually, they, they may get a group of people to surround them. That would be kind of become his disciples and, and follow him. But ultimately, there's going to be a single person. Uh, and usually, that one person will have a questionable past. Training. And what I mean by questionable is they might have something where they ran, had a run-in with the law. Or they had some character flaws that were obvious. But just got ignored. And what will happen is that leader, because they're so charismatic, because they can, they can control a room, they, they, they're really good at speaking, whatever it may be, they can draw crowds, and then because of that, they manipulate others because of that. They'll draw people in with their fancy speech. They'll, they'll say just the right things just to make people be a part of what they're doing. Number three, most of the time that these leaders grow up in a Christian environment, 
They grew up in a Christian environment. So having that Christian background then gives them a foothold with other Christians because there's automatically that, little, that, that trust, right? It's like, oh, you were a part of that church. I trust you. Okay, what do you have to say? Oh, you have this extra thing to say. Well, oh, that's interesting. Now I'm drawn in. So by having that, that background, it gives a foothold to other Christians. They can speak the language, the Christianese. They have all the, they use the right words. They'll throw words out like gospel. But they don't mean the gospel that's in the scriptures. They, they, have a different, they have a different gospel. When they use the word scripture, they're probably not talking about just the Bible. They may be talking about something else that they have added to scripture. Uh, and then, because of that background and that Christian environment, they usually have enough Bible knowledge just to twist it for their own gain. So they'll use the Bible in their writings, in their personal writings. If you look at kind of the historical characters that lead these cultish movements, they're going to say things that sound Christian. Number four, along with that, cults usually ignore, confuse, add to, demean the Bible's teachings. It starts with an attack on the inerrancy of Scripture. They'll start saying things like, yeah, the Bible's good, but it's not enough. It's not good enough. It's been corrupted. And they attack the inerrancy of Scripture, therefore meaning that it's setting them up to try to give you what's missing. So they'll attack the inerrancy of Scripture, then what they'll do is they'll revise Scripture. So they'll take the Bible and go, you know what, the Bible's not too bad, but we're going to fix it. We're going to add some things. We're going to take out some words. We're going to change some things so that we have a better Bible. So they attack it, they change it, and then they add to it. So maybe they write another book that they then call Scripture, or they add another pamphlet that becomes Scripture. Or in some cases the word of God to them just is constantly a revolving door. It's always changing depending on what the month is. Number five, they use devious methods to trap, deceive, and control followers. This is where we get into the more practical ways that they do things. Behavior control. They'll, they'll get involved with people's individual associations, their friends, their groups that they hang out with, their living arrangements, their, the type of food that they eat, the clothing that they wear, sleeping habits, finances. They'll, they'll, control, they'll, they'll start to control those things. It starts as a suggestion, and then it becomes a demand. Information control. Cult leaders deliberately withhold or distort information. They lie. They use propaganda. They limit access to outside information. Thought control. They'll use loaded words or language, kind of like gospel, but they mean something completely different. They discourage critical thinking. So like, hey, in, instead of going, hey, you know, why don't you examine the scriptures and find that answer for yourself? Instead, they'll be like, you know what? Let me just tell you what God says. I'm just going to prophesy over you right here. I'm just going to tell you what God has to say. That way you don't even have to look at this. They bar any speech critical of cult leaders or policies. Whatever the leader says goes. They're always right. And if anybody tries to dissent, then they're out. And then what they do is they teach an us versus everyone else doctrine. Meaning, they start to go... Hey, you see how all these people are persecuting us? That's because they're all wrong. And they don't get it. So what you need to do is buy in even more. All right? Uh, and emotional control. Leaders manipulate their followers via fear. It's kind of the last step. Once they got a hold of them, then they, then they go, hey, if you quit this, then you're going to hell. 
And then six, last one, they prey on the weak. They pick easy targets. They pick easy targets. Cynics, people that are just like, oh, I hate the church. Church is ridiculous. I don't want to have anything to do with it. Those are the people they love. Because they're going to give you an alternative. Oh, you hate the church? You hate hypocrites? Well, we're not hypocrites. Come check us out. They'll prey on the hurt. People that have gone through rough seasons, they will come around them and befriend them, not because they want what's best for them, but they want them to join what they're doing. They pick on people looking for something new. Hey, are you tired about, of that old truth? Let, let me give you a new truth. They prey on young people. Watch out. Confused. They prey on people that are just kind of in a season of they don't know what to do. Maybe they've gone through a, a bad situation and they don't know which way is up. So they're going to try to show them which way is up. And all, not only do they do that, they also elevate the right leaders. They find those other charismatic people that are completely sold in and bought in, and then they elevate them and give them authority. Not because of their character, not because of th they're good people, but because they're the right type of people that are going to push forward their movement. All right. Fun stuff, right? Okay. So with that, I want to do, I'm going to give two examples of, by our definition, cults. Okay, so we're, we're going we're gonna to dig in here. A couple of things before we get started. I want you to know that if you know somebody that belongs to one of these groups, they are not your enemy. They are not your enemy. It's really easy to see people on the outside of what we believe as enemies, but that's, that's not how God sees them. We need to remind ourselves that these are all people that Jesus died for who, apart from Christ, will spend eternity in hell. And that's why it's so important for us to share the truth with them. So we should pray for them and seek opportunities to help them understand the true gospel. They're not people that we need to basically push out and say no to. There are people that we should try to evangelize because we love them. Also, asterisk, note this. I am not saying that it is impossible for someone to belong to one of those group, these groups and be saved. Okay? It's not impossible for someone to belong to one of these groups and be saved. However, that would mean that they belong only by their attendance and they don't actually follow the teachings of the group. Because if they actually follow the teachings of their leaders, then they would not know the gospel. Does that make sense? I want to be clear on, on those two things. They're not our enemies. I'm not, I'm not bashing these people. This is, you know, I'm not assigning them a cult because cult, I think, sometimes has that negative connotation where we're just, like, talking about Satan people. You know, it's like, that's not what we're doing. We're just, de we define it already. It's just people that are outside of Orthodox Christianity. And people could be saved in these places. It just means that they're not actually following those things. It's not my decision. They just need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All right. Number one. Mormonism. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down the list of those six indicators, and we're going to talk about how Mormonism is a cult based on our six indicators that we are given. Okay? So does Mormonism ignore or distort the gospel? All right, so here, here's just some things. If you want to jot down notes as I go, go for it, but I'm just going to try to talk real fast because i got a lot to say. When it comes to God, Mormons believe in a plurality of gods, meaning that there's not one true God existing in three persons, a trinity. What they believe is that there's 
three gods that we know of, and there's a possibility of more gods out there. So ultimately, it's a polytheistic religion. They also believe that God the Father was once a man that progressed to being part of the Godhead, meaning that he was just a guy like everybody else, and over time he got better until he became a god. We know that that is not true. God is eternal. He has always been eternal. He has never, God the Father has never existed in human form. He has never had to change his mind and become better to try to earn his way to being a God. God is God, and that's it. In the beginning was God. With that progression, it's, it's meaning that he is now exalted. He's an immortal man with flesh and bone body which is not true. God the Father is a spirit being. Mormons believe the Trinity is not one God in three persons, but three separate gods, and there may be more gods. Mormons also believe that Jesus was the firstborn spirit child of the Heavenly Father and a Heavenly Mother. Which that comes nowhere from Scripture. And then Jesus, being the firstborn spirit child of mother, father, then progressed to the Godhead in the spirit world before being physically conceived in Mary. If you talk to a Mormon, they probably won't tell you exactly how that happened because it confuses them. Three eternal kingdoms. There's three eternal kingdoms. Most people will go... But if you want to get to the celestial kingdom, the highest form, you have to be a Mormon and you have to be a good one. Meaning that you have to follow all their rules. Only, only like the, the really bad people, whatever that means, don't get to go to eternity. They, also a weird thing, note this, Adam sin, they believe that Adam's sin was a necessary thing that allowed us to become mortal. So when they, see the, when they see the fall of man, they don't necessarily see a bad thing. They see that it was a necessary thing for us to exist. So, like I said, and then to get to that top kingdom, you have to not only believe in Jesus, but also the temple. Okay? So you can see clearly how that is not the gospel. That is not the Jesus that Scripture talks about. That is not the gospel that, that Scripture clearly tells us. All right, so let's look. Do they have a charismatic leader who controls and manipulates followers? <laughs> Gosh, y'all are going to be bad. Okay. Mormonism was founded by a guy named Joseph Smith. <laughs> Okay, here you go. Ready for this? Joseph Smith claimed that Jesus and God the Father visited him and told him that all the churches were corrupt. So, because he apparently he had this question of, God, which church should I go to? And then Jesus and God the Father, two separate beings, visit him and tell him that all the churches are bad, so you're going to start a new one. Uh, he received a special visit from angels and other biblical characters, including John the Baptist, uh, that gave him authority. John the Baptist even said, you get to be the new Aaronic priest. You're the new Aaron. And then another angel said, you're the new Melchizedek, which is in the book of Hebrews, if you want to get fancy. So he's taking this biblical language, right, and he's corrupting it and using it for his own good. Uh, just a little background on Joseph Smith. His parents were treasure hunters. And early on in his life, he was sued for using a seer stone, which was just a stone that back in the day in the 1800s, it became part of like the spiritual movement, you know, like floating, levitating tables, ghosts and spirits. They would use seer stones to hunt treasure illegally. So he got sued for that. Uh, so there's his uh, criminal background. Uh, going, going on into his life, he continued to use the seer stone to interpret his own scripture later on. Uh, but, uh, so you see that there's some legal trouble there as well. Did this leader grow up in a Christian environment? 
Uh, so like I said, this all started, the background of this is the 1830s, 1820s, 1830s, the historical Great Awakening in the United States. Uh, so there's, spirit, there's spiritism, there's spiritual awakening, there's Christianity kind of taking center stage, but also this question of he's trying to find the right church, and then he basically says, no, I need to start my own. So there's a little bit of a spiritual background there. Does he ignore, confuse, and add to and demean the Bible's teachings? So early on, Joseph Smith claimed that the King James Version was corrupted. So he and 12 other bearded men uh, went into a back room by themselves and decided to revise the King James Version. And they called it the Revised King James Version. It's still the version that the Mormons use today as their Bible. In this version, they added over 500 pages of new things to the Bible, including the verse Genesis 50, 33, where Joseph Smith actually adds himself into the Bible. It basically goes, there's going to be a seer whose name is Joseph, who comes from another Joseph, his dad, he's Joseph Jr., Joey Jr., and uh, he's going to be acclaimed and be the leader of the new people. So, uh, claims, a little bit later on, he claims to receive gold plates from an angel with hieroglyphics on them that he then translates using his seer stone. He would put the stone in a hat and go, here's what these hieroglyphics mean. Uh, oh, by the way, these gold plates, no one else knew they existed. And apparently once he was done translating this to their new scripture, they just disappeared. They went back to heaven. This became the Book of Mormon. The Mormons also added other books including a, a pamphlet of revelations. All this was considered a purer form of scripture, even though it contains racism, polygamy, and historical inaccuracies. What about, uh, what about his devious methods to trap, deceive, and control followers? So Smith initially started in New York, but he had to colonize, and he moved all of his followers, including himself, to Missouri. Uh, and then as problems started to happen there in Missouri, then they all got up and left and moved to Illinois. Uh, there were issues going on. People were criticizing him in the press, so he decided to burn the press down, which made them angry, which he then got shot in a mob fight. A man, named, a man named Brigham Young then takes control of the Mormons and moves the whole group to Salt Lake City, and the rest is history. Now that's why there's a bunch of Mormons in Utah. Uh, they train up. So here's just some things you need to know about kind of how they do things. They train up young people to believe that they are right and everyone else is wrong and don't question anything. They, be, they do not believe... They will say they're Christians, but here's what they mean. They do not mean that they are Christians like you and me. What they mean is that they are the only true Christians, and we are all wrong. The group practiced polygamy all the way up until almost 1900, and it's endorsed by their scripture. They made a law that said that you couldn't be involved in polygamy. That's where you have multiple wives. Uh, there was a law that was made, so then everybody was like, hey, let's stop practicing this, but they never removed it from their scripture. Not only that, they forced their young people to go on mission. And they also require people to tithe 10% just to belong to the temple. And they control their diets. They have special dietary restrictions. Caffeine. Yeah. All right. So, how do they pray on the week? How do they pray on the week? Mormonism markets itself really well. 
They are, they are moral people. They present themselves as a wholesome family movement. And if you look up famous Mormons, you are not going to find anybody that has a lot of troubling history. They're all very well-spoken, clean people. They're in the media. They've become famous, but they haven't let that get to their head. They give all that. They're, they're, they're super generous. So it, it very much portrays them as the right way for everybody else to pray on the week. Okay. Number two. Jehovah's Witnesses. Do they ignore and distort the gospel? Jehovah's Witnesses believe that God is our Father and the Watchtower, which is their teaching, is our Mother. Jesus, Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Jesus slash Michael is first of creation, agent of creation, a God, but not the God. The God is the Father. There is no Holy Spirit as God. Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is just a force, but not God. Michael slash Jesus, the Spirit, gave up his existence and the Spirit form to become the physical Jesus. And then Jesus became just a human, not God. Uh, and Jesus became, once he died, he just didn't, he ceased to exist. Is that the Jesus of Scripture? No. No. All right, so do they have a charismatic leader? Charles Taz Russell, manager, he, by, the, by his mid-20s, early 20s, he was the manager of several men's furnishing stores, so he, he became very wealthy very quickly, so what does that tell us? He's a salesman. At the age of 18, he began a Bible study group that pretty soon after he started it named him Pastor. He started a publishing company, which he controlled all of the financials for without any accountability to the church that he had. He hid money from the church, and in one of the publications, they, he started pushing out all of his, pub, basically he would publish all of his sermons and, and send them out everywhere. Uh, he's, there, he would put advertisements in these publications for miracle wheat, and basically it was sold at a higher price. And the guarantee was that because it was blessed by God, it would produce more wheat than any other wheat crop or whatever. Uh, so, and he, and he would encourage his followers to pay this high price so that he could then fund his printing of his material. So basically, he was overcharging people that he was duping to follow him and his teachings to pay more money so that he could push out more stuff to get more people to follow him to make more money. There you go. Early on in his life, he got married to a woman, and uh, she became his co-partner at the publisher. But his, life le his wife left him, claiming that he was a scammer and a womanizer. And during that trial, because of all the bad things and all the bad press that was coming out against him, then he started a lawsuit against another... Uh, newspaper that was publishing bad cartoons about him. Uh, and then in that trial, he lost because it became known that not only was he scamming people in a womanizer, but also he lied about his theological education. He had none. He lied about knowing Greek and Hebrew. He knew none. He lied about being ordained. He never had been. And he lied about preaching abroad. He had never done that. As a teenager, Russell denounced the doctrine of hell, even though he heard that in a Presbyterian church, so he had that background. So how did he, uh, what were his methods to control his followers? So like I said, he started the Watchtower magazine, 
and he also started printing these things called scripture studies and they've had to be revised over time because of all their errors but these scripture studies became synonymous with scripture the message that they sent out was that the bible wasn't enough and here, here, here is basically the thing if you don't read my stuff you won't understand the bible my information is the only way that you're going to be able to understand the bible they, they also published their own translation of scripture known as the New World Translation. Uh, on the New World Translation, there was five people that worked on it. Four of them did not have any training in Greek, Hebrew, or Aramaic. And the one that claimed to have some training never finished and graduated seminary. How did he control the followers? Basically, they started a campaign where he told the people that were following him that to be faithful to God meant going door to door and handing out his pamphlets that he produced. So they still do that today. You may have a Jehovah's Witness that knocks on your door to come and speak to you about the truth that they want to share with you. And they will hand you pamphlets, and they will hand you books, and they will hand you all of this stuff. There's a website you can go on to where they, they have a really well done website that gives you all their information. But the whole key is that they are, are pushing their information out. And he told them, basically, if you do not push this information out, then you are not a good follower of Christ. He also condemned celebrating holidays and patriotism. And independent thinking is discouraged. So if they ever knock on your door and you go, hey, do you want to like look at this with me? They'll be like, no, I'm not interested. Here, look at my thing. Okay? Uh, as far as praying on the week, it's, it's pretty much the same thing as Mormons. They have the same targets to try to find people. So there's just a couple. I, I, like, I can't get into a bunch tonight, but I also have a list of some others that you can kind of look at on your own. Christian science, spiritism, unity, school of Christianity, Unitarian movement, uh, the Church of God. I have an asterisk by Seventh-day Adventist and Catholicism because they're a little bit different than typical cults. Uh, but if you, at the core of it, Seventh-day Adventists kind of have a, good, a decent understanding of who Jesus is and what the gospel is, but they've kind of twisted and added to it, and it's all about, like, the revelatory end times. Uh, with Catholicism, I have that on our list of cults because mainly if you look at the, their gospel, their gospel is not by faith alone, through Christ alone. Now, I know some Catholics, I have friends that are Catholics that are saved because they believe in the gospel, the true gospel of Christ. I also have some, some, some Catholic friends in my life who are more lost than you could ever imagine because they've been led astray by the bad teachings of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church teaches that grace alone comes through faith alone, but you can only earn grace by doing good works. You can earn grace by getting married in a Catholic Church. You can earn grace by taking part in the Lord's Supper. You can earn grace by coming to Mass. You can earn grace by do, going through confession. All these things are little things where it's like you earn grace. Uh, they've also made up things like purgatory, which is nowhere in Scripture, uh, but they believe that that's where you pay for your sins. Guess what? Jesus already paid for my sins on the cross. So, you can tell that their gospel is different. It's the whole reason why Martin Luther had to start the Reformation. Because the Catholic Church deviated from the teachings of Scripture and they started making their own way and their own teachings. So you guys can look into more of that. I, I want to end, I'm, I'm a little over time, I want to end with um, how you can protect yourself and help others. I just got just a few things that you can do here. Study Scripture. Here's the best thing you can do. Study scripture in order to know true doctrine and biblical teaching. If you, if you want to know how you can combat against this bad teaching 
No good teaching. Pray. Pray. If you've got people that are following these false religions, are practicing in these cults, pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that God would show them the true gospel. Pray for opportunities that you would have to share the gospel with them. This can be done whenever you develop a healthy and safe relationship with them. Remember, a lot of times when they're trying to develop a relationship with you, they're just trying to convert you. They, they know that you are, you know, in the case of Mormons, like they, they know that you are not a real Christian and they want to get you to be a real Christian, a real Mormon. They're not interested in sharing on your side. You've got to have that relationship first and have a safe boundary there. Uh, use the scriptures and take time to help individuals identify their cult's particular biblical distortions in a safe setting. So walk through. Learn. If, you, if you've got friends that come from these particular things, take some time to learn what they actually believe. Uh, there's different things on YouTube. I can suggest some things, some different videos to look at that will help you with that. There's some, if you're connected with Right Now Media, uh, you can do that as well. There's some good teaching there. Avoid criticizing, confrontation, and arguing. Remember, they're not our enemies. They're lost people that we love, that we want to know Christ. As often as possible, give them an infusion of truth about who God is and how he sees us. Speak truth. Speak truth. Be truth. Speak truth. And then as they start to drift away, as they start to go, no, this isn't right, connect them with a healthy church. We'd love for them to come here. If not, just make sure that they get to a healthy church. We don't want them to bounce from being Mormon to going to the Jehovah's Witness temple. We don't want them to do that to going to the church of God. We want them to be in a biblical church that preaches and teaches and lives out the gospel. And it doesn't have to be here, but we want them to be a good church. All right. All right. That's all I got. Let me pray for us. If you have any questions tonight, you can come ask me. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to do Ask Michael because it's a little late over. So just come, come talk to me if you have questions. But I'd love to pray for you guys. And as, as we're praying, if you know any friends in your circle that maybe follow one of these false teachings, let's just pray for them during that time. So I'll, I'll say something like, pray for your friends now. We'll, I'll give you a chance to kind of mention them, ask God on behalf of them to save them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word and try to understand more clearly how we can so easily get your word wrong. God, I pray that you would help protect us, protect our hearts, protect our minds, uh, not only from false teaching, but from our, our own selves and how we can lead ourselves astray. God, right now, right now, I just ask that uh, for all the people that we know, all the people we know, God, that have fallen into one of these false religions or cults. God, I just pray that you would save them. Help them help them see the truth of the gospel. God, open their eyes and their hearts and their ears to be able to hear the truth of who Jesus is. That scripture is sufficient to understand the gospel and that the gospel itself is sufficient for eternal life. God, I pray for us that you would give us hearts to see our friends not as enemies against our church, but God, help us to see them as lost people that need to know you. God, give us boldness to be able to step into uncomfortable conversations to glorify you. God, help prepare our hearts and prepare our minds to be able to have these conversations.
just kind of at the end of the day, we just want people to hear the truth and respond to the truth with faith. So God, we trust you and we thank you for loving us and saving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awesome. Love you guys. Like I said, if you have any other questions, you can come and chat with me.